I'd like to um, start by thanking Victor and everyone else who is um, <coughs> a part of making this possible. It's been an exciting day so far. Um, the project I'm going to tell you about today, the Fragile Families Challenge, is a collaboration, and in fact, it's a mass collaboration. Um, so I'm actually, there are so many participants in this research project, I cannot list them all on the slide. Um, but I definitely want to acknowledge a couple people in particular. First is the co-organizers of the challenge. So these are Ian Lundberg and Alex Kindle, who are both graduate students in sociology at Princeton, and Sarah McClanahan, who is one of my colleagues. Um, there were hundreds of other people who participated. Is there, maybe there's someone in this room who participated in the challenge. If you did, thank you. Um, also, we have a board of advisors um, that included many people who helped oversee this process, including Duncan. So thank you, Duncan. Um, you can all tell him I thanked him. Um, OK. Um, so one, one way. I'm going to dramatically simplify an enormous field of sociological research. Uh, so you, you can think of social mobility research as a model kind of like this. So we have some outcome that we're interested in. This is sometimes called attainment. So examples of this might be academic achievement, occupation, income. Uh, we have this other component, which is the predictable component. So I've written this out as the expected value of y given a vector of x, a vector of um, variables about a person or predictor. So often this is written down as a regression model. And so we might say something like, uh, you know, women tend to earn more than men, let's say, or, or vice versa, or people who have more education earn more or less than other people. So these are the kinds of statements that we usually make in mobility research. And we focus on this component of the results. In fact, there is another component, this unpredictable component, these error terms. And we very rarely talk about them. Um, and in fact, empirically, so the, this leads us to kind of a puzzle, which is that our theories tend to focus on the predictable components. We have all kinds of statements about why certain people have more of something than other people have less of that thing. But in practice, the unpredictable component seems to dominate. So the I guess classic statement of this in mobility research is like the work by Jenks and his colleagues. And so the question is like, well, what is going on with this unpredictable component? Um, so one possible explanation among many is that we're not really doing a good job estimating the actual functional relationship between these predictors and the outcomes. So maybe it's the case that we're fitting these linear regression models and the actual relationship between the variables and the outcome is nonlinear or complicated or heterogeneous. And so if we just did a better job of fitting this functional form, then a lot of this unpredictability would go away. And so what we're going to do in the Fragile Families Challenge is try to estimate this conditional expectation as well as we possibly can. And so that means, one, bringing in a bunch of ideas from machine learning, like the ideas that David saw kind of, uh, we're taking the sheepdog approach uh, <laughs> and trying to have a leaderboard and getting state of the art. And we're fully embracing that. And we are, realize there are certain things that we don't get from this approach. But we think that rather than trying to achieve both of these goals simultaneously, we're going to try to achieve some of the understanding goals in a second step of the project. Um, but also, rather than just us saying, OK, well, we, we can like open up scikit-learn and we can do our own machine learning, then we thought, you know what? But maybe there's really great ideas about machine learning out there that we don't know. Maybe the people that are the best in the world at machine learning aren't even in universities. So if we really want to be able to estimate this as well as possible, we'd like to have as many people as possible participating in this. And then we can know that the results are not sensitive to the way any one particular person approached the problem, because there are many, many ways to approach this problem. And so that's how we ended up doing this mass collaboration about predict, uh, prediction task. So um, David talked uh, about the, the sheepdog and the telescope. Uh, there's the Brayman paper about the two cultures of modeling. 
One way, my favorite way of sort of capturing the differences between the way social scientists and data scientists think about the world is uh, described in this Melanathon and Spies paper about the beta hats and the y hats. So if you think about a regression model, as you saw before, it is y hats and beta hats. Social scientists generally focus on the beta hats and testing whether those beta hats are different than zero. Um, then I had this great experience of doing a sabbatical at Microsoft Research, and I went to my first talk, and there's a lot of data, there's a lot of technical stuff, and there was no beta hats, and there was no p-values. And I was like, what is going on here? And like, what it was all about was y hats. How well can we predict something? So this, a trivial example with this would be like a spam filter. How well can we predict whether an email is spam or not spam? And we want to assess our, our approach to doing this by how well we can do these predictions, not based on like, oh, this kinds of things are characteristic of spam or not spam. Okay? So what we're going to do in this project is one way to think about it is it's y hat in the service of beta hat. So what I'm going to show you today is the y hat part, and then what we are working on now is the understanding part, and I can talk a little bit about that if there's time. Okay, so this is the Fragile Families Challenge. It's a scientific mass collaboration designed to predict and understand life outcomes of disadvantaged kids and families in the U.S. Um, the empirical setting is the Fragile Family and Child Wellbeing Study that Sarah and her colleagues have been working on for the last 20 years. It's really an amazing treasure. Um, they sampled 5,000 children uh, born in 20 U.S. cities, and they followed them from birth to age 15. The sample is an oversample of uh, non-marital births. Um, this data has already been used in hundreds of papers and dozens of dissertations, but we want to use it in this very different way. These papers and dissertations have been in the beta hat way, and we want to flip it around and try to do it in a y hat way. Um, so before doing that, I want to just talk briefly about why I think we should care about the predictability of social outcomes, because sometimes when I've talked to other sociologists, they're just generally not interested. They're like, this is not, that's not our business, that's not our game, we're not uh, trying to, we're not like weather forecasters. Uh, um, so I think we should care about it for scientific reasons because it's a good way of sort of checking in with the world. Uh, so if we have all of the things that we think are important in a data set, and with all of those things, we still can't do a very good job of predicting the outcome if the unpredictable term dominates then that may be a sign that we are missing important things, or maybe our theory should then focus on the unpredictable component rather than the predictable component. Um, so I want to be clear, I'm not saying that prediction, if we can predict these things, that does not necessarily mean we understand what's happening, but if we cannot predict them, that is probably a sign that we don't understand very well what is happening. Uh, the second reason is for policy reasons. So, this is an article from the New York Times Magazine about something that's happening right now in Allegheny County, Pennsylvania, uh, which is basically the city of Pittsburgh. And so what's happening there is the Child Protective Services hotline. There's a hotline people can call in if they suspect child endangerment. The person who answers the phone has to decide whether to do an investigation or not of the call. And this is a very high stakes decision. Obviously, if you there is a kid in danger and you do not investigate, that is very bad. It's also the case that if there is a kid who, if the, there is no problem and you do an investigation, that is bad as well. These investigations are very disruptive to these families. They're very intrusive. It's not good. So we'd really like to be able to make this decision as wisely and accurately as possible. And so what they've decided to do in Allegheny County is the county has built an administrative records database and then they've trained a predictive model uh, and so that um, when the phone call comes in this model produces a risk score for this kid based on the data that already exists in their system and then the person who's answering the phone has to decide whether given this risk score and given the new information that comes from the call whether to investigate or not so it's algorithmic assisted decision making in a high stakes setting. Increasingly though, I think we'll see 
algorithmic decision making without a human in the loop in high stakes settings. And so some people find this deeply, deeply troubling and very scary. Um, other people find it very exciting and a potential for hope because they point out the limitations of existing systems. I have a lot of mixed feelings about the whole thing, to be totally honest. Uh, and so I think one of the things we really need is more just sort of basic scientific research about the predictability of social outcomes that can then inform policymakers as they try to make these decisions about whether to use algorithmic decision making or algorithmic human assisted algorithmic decision making. Um, so this itself is, I would think of as basic research and I would not suggest that a policymaker should do anything or not do anything based on what we say. Um, okay, so now a little bit more about the data. So this is the way a social scientist might view the fragile families data set. There are different data collection modules. These are collected at different time points in the life of the child. Uh, I got involved in the fragile family study at this point where there's some data collected uh, when the kids are 15 years old but that data is not yet publicly available. So basically Sarah ha and her colleagues had this data, they're preparing it and cleaning it and documenting it for release to the public. So this is an enormous magical moment. It's a really great opportunity um, that exists in every single longitudinal survey that I know of. There is always this period where there is some data collected that is not yet publicly available and so then we can do a process that they often do in machine learning where they create a prediction challenge. And so here's a way someone from machine learning might look at the fragile families data. It's a, just a big rectangle. Uh, so we have uh, 4,200 families. We're in the challenge data set and we have uh, almost 13,000 features or what we would call variables. So I want to point out one thing about the shape of this data. So there are more predictors, then there are cases. And so this is sometimes called high dimensional data. So social scientists don't often think of ourselves as having high dimensional data. But in fact, if we looked at all of the data we've collected, we often do have very high dimensional data. Um, in fact, Sarah was very surprised at this. Like, well, she's like, wow, we have really collected a lot. Um, and so then at age 15, there are about 1,500 features that were collected. And so then working with Sarah and other researchers uh, who study disadvantaged families, we picked uh, six key outcomes to study. And we set up one of these uh, uh, prediction challenges using the common task method. So let me explain this data structure here. So one of these, I'll tell you all the outcomes in a second. But first, I'm just going to focus on one of uh, grades in school, so GPA. So what we did is two people who applied to participate in the challenge and who passed our screening procedure, they had access to all of the background data about all of the families. They had access to the GPA of half of the kids. Then they could build any kind of model they want. They could use any kind of machine learning they want. They could use any kind of social theory they want, whatever they want. Uh, then they submit to us uh, their predictions for all of the kids, GPAs, and they also submit to us their code and a narrative explanation of what they're doing. Uh, then we give them a score based on their predictions. Uh, this is the leaderboard idea that we heard about before. And so we can say to them, OK, your predictions are this accurate, and someone else gets a different score. And then this is presented on a leaderboard. Then when the challenge ends, we open up this holdout set, and we can see who made the most accurate predictions. So this, our assessment of this accuracy, again, it has nothing to do with what theory they're using. It has nothing to do with what method they're using. So it may be the case that simpler methods work better in this setting. And that would be very hard to detect if we have the normal academic process that rewards complicated, sophisticated methods. Um, also, there's nothing in here about how we make the assessment is in no way based on your CV, where you're working, your ability to talk about fancy things. Uh, it's really just based on how well you can predict these numbers. Um, uh, I also want to point out one really great thing about this holdout data is I've talked to someone who said, oh, I can make the predictions perfect. I can get the R squared all the way to 1. And I was like, wow, that's amazing. How would you do that? This person said, I would just put in a bunch more predictors, and then the R squared will go to 1. 
And I said, that is true for the in-sample data, but that is not true for the out-of-sample data. So I want to be clear, this is a real prediction of holdout data. Uh, so in other words, if you think about the R squares that you've seen in sociological research that do not have holdout data, those are probably actually overestimates of what the actual R squared would be. In all. So it's actually worse than we might even think now. OK, so that's the structure of the challenge. The outcomes, we picked six. So there were three continuous outcomes and three binary outcomes. So GPA, grit, material hardship. Uh, binary outcomes, housing eviction, layoff of a caregiver, and job training for a caregiver. So I want to point out a couple things about this. One is that some of the outcomes are properties of the kid, some are properties of the household, and some are properties of the primary caregiver. Um, and that is, uh, I guess, all I will say about these outcomes now, except one other thing is that people could um, try to predict one of these outcomes or three of these outcomes or all of these outcomes. So you could also think of this as sort of six challenges happening simultaneously rather than one single challenge. Yep. Could you tell us what GRIT is? I can tell you what GRIT is. GRIT is uh, four questions on a survey averaged together. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> so I think a good way of, I think Paul's question, let me just add some context for people who are not familiar with this. Um, uh, GRIT is a psychological measure which a psychological construct which may be hard to measure if it is exactly one thing. Uh, so really what we're saying is how can we predict, can we predict measure what people say on a survey about their grittiness. Um, so I'm running short on time. So I just want to say hundreds of researchers participated in this. Uh, they were trying to minimize the mean squared error in the holdout data set. Um, so we just compare their predictions and take the squared error and the average. So I want to ask this question, using high quality social science data set collected since birth. So I went collected since birth, high quality. So these, Sarah and her colleagues used standard social science scales. They measured the data that they thought, with the features that they thought were important. Uh, and using modern machine learning methods. So any kind of fancy thing that you can imagine. Um, how accurately can we predict outcomes for children and families? So um, here, the, we're, to calibrate this, we're going to use the holdout R squared. So this is basically like the mean squared error, but then compared to the error you would get if you just did the mean of the training data. So a kind of natural thing would be, if I'm going to predict the GPA for kids in the holdout set, I'll just use the average GPA in the training set. So I'm just going to say everyone gets 2.87 as their predicted GPA. So, how much better can we do than that? And so this number ranges from 0 to 1. And so how many people think it's higher than 0? It has to be higher than 0. So we're going to do it. Everyone raise your hand. So think for a minute. You can pick any of these. Out so this is, people always start asking questions like, which outcome? And so pick one outcome that you're interested in. So you can pick GPA if you'd like, or any other outcome of your interest. Um, try to guess what the holdout R squared is for the best model. The best model. Okay? So greater than zero. Okay, it has to be greater than zero. Greater than 0.1. Keep your hand up. I'm just gonna keep going higher and higher and we'll see how long people keep their hand up. Greater than zero, greater than 0.1, greater than 0.2, greater than 0.3, greater than 0.4. Wow, these are really greater than 0.5. Okay. Uh, so I would say around 0.3. These are generally lower numbers than I usually see, particularly when I talk to data scientists who usually are like 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.9. Um, all right, so let's look at the results. Here are the results. This is the holdout R squared for the six outcomes. So for material and hardship uh, and GPA, the results, uh, the R squared is about 0.2, and for the others, the R squared is pretty close to zero. So this is the way that I think we should be looking at this plot, which shows the full range. So the dominant pattern that we see is this vast white space up here. And so the big question for us going forward is, what is that vast white space? What is going on? So this pattern, I totally believe. This is a real pattern. And the question is, why is this what is happening? Uh, and I have a bunch of 
possible ideas about that. We have some more results. Uh, so, but it's time for questions. And so maybe in some of your questions, I'll get to show some more slides. Whoa, OK, thank you. Paul, you. So, so maybe this will give you a chance to. <laughs> so if you think about why things happen to people, it's not surprising that we can't predict them very well, right? Because things happen to people because of the flow of experiences and behaviors in a, in a range of different social contexts in which those behaviors occur. There's no way we can mention, measure those. And um, we don't understand their interactions very well. So what we do is we take these variables, which are hunches about the nature of the behaviors that are associated with these kind of very abstract. Mm -hmm. So given that, you wouldn't really expect to have a whole lot of predictive accuracy, right? OK, so first thing I like about your question is that it is actually a theory about unpredictability. right? You have an explanation for why it should be unpredictable. And that's actually not very common in sociology, I would say. So if you, like, there, in economics, they have this like, efficient market hypothesis, which is like a clear theory about why stock prices should be unpredictable. I, I would say there's no equivalent kind of theory in sociology. Um, the second question, so, so and that's one way of looking at that. So first, I like it. Then the other way is like, it's true that um, we often don't have a lot of measures. But I want to be clear, like, they have really been following these people since birth and collecting tons of information, including this in-home assessment where they go to the house and like measure the physical, look at the physical environment see whether they're exposed electrical outlets. Like, this is incredibly detailed. They survey the kid. They, I will also say the other things that they have, they have measures of these outcomes in earlier waves. So like, if you're trying to predict whether someone is going to be evicted when the kid is 15, they know whether someone was evicted when the kid was age 9. right? And so these seem like they should potentially be good predictors if you have lagged measures. And you have tons of other things. I guess it's yeah. That I, it's hard to say it, what what is expected and unexpected. Okay, Victor. So uh, let's assume that uh, we live in a multi-causal world, mm -hmm. uh, and there's tremendous uh, variety in uh, human behavior, and humans are uh, not have low level standard behavior mm -hmm. compared to uh, say a non-reflexive creature. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so it seems you could say in a conservative way, well, it's still pretty good to get that model uh, because there's so much uh, noise out there yep. and so many different potential causes and uh, you have a big sample. Sure. So then I would pause it. Then I would ask, like, what, are, and this is, this is not a fair question, but what are the, the sources of these heterogeneity that, are, that Sarah and her colleagues have not collected? Because if you sit and you look through these code books, it is impressive. They have collected a lot, a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. So uh, what it could be, and what we're increasingly interested in thinking about, is to what extent did Sarah and her colleagues measure all the right stuff, but just we don't have enough data to learn this conditional expectation function. So if you have this very high dimensional space and you want to measure the expected value in each of these parts of this space, you potentially need lots and lots of data for people of each type, of each category, right? And they only have 5,000 people here. So in the training data, there's roughly 2,000 people. And of those, some of them have dropped out of the study. So there are roughly 1,500 people with outcome data. And so when you talk to machine learning people, they're like, that 1,500 people, that's like nothing. And it's like, it may be the case that we're like fundamentally just not at the scale that we need to be at. So here's. I mean, one thing we're thinking about is like, what if we had more families? So like, how would the results change? It's very difficult for us to create more data. Unfortunately, we cannot go back in time. Uh, and even if we could go back in time, this would be extremely expensive. So what we can do is downsample our data. So we can pretend we have less data, and we can see how the performance changes as we get more and more data. So. Uh, it's hard to see all the different scales here, so I will briefly summarize this, that as you get more data within the range that we have, the predictive performance improves slightly. 
Um, but you know, if if you know, let's imagine Sarah got twice as big a grant from NIH, that's not going to move it to a really really high number. Now, if Sarah had a hundred times more data or a thousand times more data, like let's say Sarah's friends with Jeff Bezos, and Jeff said, yeah, let's just collect data from all kids born in these 20 cities at this time. Would that have, how would that have done? We don't know. It's very hard to extrapolate from this amount of data to something that's so different. Okay. We'll go around like that. Okay. It sounds like you're basically trying to say that this can't be just random noise. Um, what like I don't I still don't know why a low R squared. You're basically yeah. saying hey, everyone you should really care about the low R yeah. squared. It's just by saying their squares are low without giving a particular reason why we should care about the low R squared. Sure. Like they're low. That seems troubling, but well, so I, but, but but why? You know, I mean, a econometric theory when we care about unbiased estimation of a parameter. Yeah. The R square isn't really in that. You know, uh, sure. set of things we should worry about. Sure, so. sure. So, a couple things about that. So, one is if we're going to use these predictions for policy reasons, like the Allegheny County, then I think we should care about the accuracy. Uh, second, for scientific reasons, if we have this huge error term, uh, a lot of our, and we're trying to use these betas to be causal effects, a lot of these are then assumptions about what is the error term. So, for example, Conditional ignorability, which is the assumption that's underlying when you try to make that beta a causal effect, that is an assumption about the error term. And no one can tell me what is in that error term. And so how, why should I believe conditional ignorability if you can't even tell me what's in the error term? And what's in the error term seems to be so much bigger than the things that you're actually measuring that you say are important. So I think it does have implications for how we think about Causal so inference R as well. R squares in like aggregate research, cross national research, yeah. the R squares are all 0.9, 0.95. And in individual panel data, the R squares are like what you were showing, 0 0.03, 0 0.06. So it's just like there's a lot of randomness in individual behavior, and there's much less randomness uh, the more you aggregate. Sure. So, absolutely, as we aggregate, you would expect that this randomness would be averaged out. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't be interested in the individual level behavior because a lot of the R theories are about a lot of the mobility research, for example, is about individual level behavior. Um, we'll go. Yeah. Okay. If, uh, uh, Arnaud had his hand up first, then Feliz, and then we'll keep going. Okay. Uh, so first off, uh, wonderful, uh, wonderful work. So I really like it. Um, so I agree there's a large area that is, you know, error um, or unpredictability, but there is some variation here in these six outcomes. And so if I might, you know, conjecture something about unpredictability, it would be uh, we're trying to explain individual level outcomes here. Yes. Um, so the kind of thing you're going to have, perhaps good data. And the individual level outcomes vary in the degree to which the individual kind of has some control over it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you would think things that are really more a function of the individual itself, like something that is inside that person, would do better than things that are outside of the control of that person, that are social. Um, now, I'm not saying that everything on the left-hand side is not social, but yeah. to a lesser yeah. degree, you yeah. GPA, you know, there is a, a talent component there, um, and that talent component is perhaps less uh, present than the others. So sure. yeah, that would be a theory about unpredictability of the individual level. Exactly. And so, but what you would want then to test that theory would be lots of different outcomes. So we only have six data points that you can use to theorize about, uh, and you're, then you're testing your model on the same data that you've trained it on. Um, so I guess this gets into the idea that we hope that more people will do challenges like this uh, so that we can then try to have an understanding of what kinds of outcomes are unpredictable with what kinds of data. Because the other thing is, like, although the fragile families collected tons and tons of stuff, they certainly did not collect everything that you might imagine. Um, so I think, yeah, that's an interesting direction. Uh, Feliz, we're going to... Are, are we, is it time for lunch? Uh, lunch? Okay. Is it, do we stop? Well, uh, your final question then we should... Okay. I love that this is so humbling, and I think this is a good thing to realize, that even if we have good people <coughs> in the state, 
data, we're still kind of in the dark about you know, uh, the unpredictable component. But what if the social, I'm just, my question yeah. is more about evaluating the performance of these models. Yeah. What if the social world has changed in particular ways that favors the model? So the performance is, mm -hmm. you know, less about what you put in, but more about how things have changed. So, so you're saying maybe it's something about kids born in this time period in the U.S.? Is that the... Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So if, if you were going to design something like this, you might not want an enormous time gap between the last measured outcome and the thing you're trying to predict. On the other hand, people make it sound like a lot of things are fixed by basically your birth. And so you would say predicting over a six-year time window is not that long. Um, then there's this question that we struggled with a lot about is age 15 a particularly unpredictable age? So this is a little bit building on what our nose is saying is like, are certain things more or less predictable? Are certain things at different times in your life more or less predictable? So a classic example from the mobility research is this life cycle bias. So if you look, or what they call life cycle bias, if you look at the correlation between parent income and kid income, that correlation changes as the kid ages. So it's low when the kid is in their 20s, and then it gets older as the kid ages into being up 30s and 40s. So it is consistent with the idea that there are certain parts of your life that are more or less unpredictable. I think certain things about the kids at age 15 is potentially a particularly unpredictable time. But again, four of these six outcomes are not for the kid at age 15. They're for the parent, and there's no reason to suspect that. I mean, you could, you could make a case, but I don't think it's a super strong case that, oh, when your kid is 15, what your life is like as a parent or what your household is like is going to be particularly unpredictable. I yeah, think, yes. Okay. Maybe as a quick response to what Cristobal said, in order to really assess whether it is just noise or whether there is some factors that we haven't taken in, in, into account yet, it might be also interesting to look at the training error. Because if you look at the training error, and we let's say we have zero percent training error on a given data set, we just predict everything perfectly, but then on the holdout sample, and now I would want to see that the holdout sample has the same exact means as uh, our training uh, mean, and then we can say, well, on the aggregate, uh, it is the same data set, basically, but um, when we uh, then try to predict uh, our uh, exact values on, uh, in the holdout set, uh, we miss it, then it's indeed just noise, it's nothing else. Um, but if, um, um, if the training error is also high, then I would say, okay, there is factors that we haven't taken into account. Okay, so a couple things. One is the training set and the test set are equivalent. They were just randomly created. Yeah, but are the means also... So, yeah, the means are the same in the training and test set. So we, the other thing is we have everyone who participated uploaded all of their predictions, and, so, and all of that will be released open source when we publish this paper. So it will become then a new source of data where you have a bunch of people working on the same problem with the same data with the same goal, and so that would enable more kinds of methodological research, like are the predictions better, how much better are they in the training data than the holdout data, how does that vary by the type of method used. But I do want to say that just because there's an error term, that does not mean that it's like random. And I want to just say that what we're trying to do now is find all that other stuff. So like we should acknowledge that like we don't we might not know everything that's happening in the world and so we are really interested in trying to use this prediction this is the part about helping us with understanding um, so there is all that there may be all this stuff out there that's impacting these kids that we are not currently measuring and so we're calling that stuff dark matter and we are now going out and looking for that by doing in-depth interviews so what we've done is we've found the kids who have the biggest residuals we've we've sampled those kids we are out now this summer in three cities doing in-depth interviews with these kids and their primary caregiver to try to find out why some of these kids are doing so much better than expected and why some of these kids are struggling unexpectedly. And we hope through that we will help figure out maybe what is going on here and that can help us make sure we're measuring the right things and our theories are considering the right things. But in your best performing models, yeah. having reviewed at least one of these, yes. You can't tell them what's producing high performance. The models don't tell you what are the parameters that produce high performance or low performance. Right. So what we can do, though, is we can say, first of all, your predicted GPA based on the best available data and the best available model was uh, 2.0. Yeah. 
and you have a 3.5. So something about you is allowing you to beat the odds. Like, if something about you is not captured by the best available data we have and the best available machine learning we have and the best available way of combining these two things. So what is that stuff? That's what we want to find out.